No pressure whatsoever. <laughs> Thanks, Alia. Okay, we're just getting the uh, input switched over and we'll get started. But I'm happy to see everybody here today. Uh, I know I'm tired. Lots of good stuff rolling through my head. I don't think I went to sleep till about midnight. So, uh, and then I was excited about getting up, so I was up early. So, you know, I think the excitement of the talk will keep me from yawning, though. Okay. Awesome. So who had a good first day? Woo! Let's thank the uh, organizers again for a second. Okay. So I'm here to talk to you today about the logum paradox. And I don't expect any of you to know what the heck logum means, and I'll explain that in a second. But if you came to my workshop yesterday, and Alia just spoke about the name of it, that it was, uh, how can things go to heck in a handbasket? My sort of theme, and I didn't actually plan it this way, maybe my subconscious knew it, but it was all about understanding the things that we do and how it can really cause negative consequences to happen. So this talk is extending that theme and having us explore a little bit about that. But first I want to share with you sort of my history and, and experience of, you know, that I've experienced no matter what job I was in. So I've worked at Turner Broadcasting on major sites like CNN.com and NBA.com. I've worked at F5 Networks as an IT manager in the web dev team. And it doesn't matter where I work, it always feels like this is our normal day. We have a lot of stakeholders. I've never been privileged enough to be in a team where we managed our own backlog and we got to decide what we did. Always in multiple stakeholder situations. And each stakeholder has enough work to keep me busy the entire time. Every day, you know, I could just work on one person's stuff and, you know, not run out of things to do. So needless to say, when that happens, you get a little bit underwater. You feel like you're drowning, very overworked. And people expect and think that their work is the most important thing to do all the time. And they get upset when I don't treat it that way or when you don't treat it that way. It makes sense. I mean, that's their job, to care about what they want. But when that situation happens and they don't understand how that impacts the organization, what happens is you get feedback that you're slow. Your team is, you know, uh, not meeting their expectations. When I first came to F5 Networks, I had a stakeholder group, a support team that said, you know, I don't think your team could go slower even if they tried. I mean, that was a pretty damning um, statement about how my team was working, and it felt bad. And so when your management hears things like that, then you get pressure to do more and more and more and work harder, get more done with less. You know, I was talking about this at a table. I don't know if it was at lunch or at the party yesterday, but we talk about get more done with less, apply grit, you know, power through, push through, and these are all things that just make you want to punch someone, you know? <laughs> and <laughs> what happens is that working harder, getting it done, translates to more hours, more weekends, working overtime, uh, less time with your families, and adding short-term staff even. You know, that's the favorite thing to do is add people to a project when things aren't going badly or when things are going badly. And then oftentimes it's very transitory. So once you get them and you finally get them worked in, then they roll out. And then when you have the problem again, it repeats the whole cycle. So <laughs> I've had a lot of situations too where I've had multiple stakeholders um, commit me to do things that are actually impossible to do. I've had sales teams that sell, sold sponsorships on NBA.com that we could not actually deliver. And sometimes we could deliver, but they cost more to deliver than we made from the sponsorship. And it really did want me to have this in my office or my cube, and just because I felt like banging my head against a wall all the time. And I'm thinking, you know, how in the world did this ever make sense to someone to apply this kind of, to make this kind of decision? And I realized that it's not really that people are trying to be super jerks. You know, um, it's that people don't really understand the consequences of their choices. So these sales teams, they are incentivized on selling as many sponsorships as they can. They have no information about the delivery. They have no incentive to care about the delivery. If you're incentivized on gross sales, that's what you're going to optimize for. 
So our problems are a little stealthier than a pack of wannabe jerks, right? It's that we really need to think about the consequences. <clears throat> the problem is, is that we have this concept of inattentional blindness, and we don't even know it. We don't think about it. Now, it makes sense because we could not process every cue or everything that goes on around us. It's physically impossible. So it's one of these things where your body sort of decides what it's going to pick out. And we see what we're looking for. When we make a choice, we know why we're doing it. We're looking for our intended consequences. We set metrics to see did the thing I expect to happen, happen. And then we're also occasionally aware of looking for a few things that might go wrong. But we always, we don't always see the things that we need to see. We see what we're looking for. So I'm going to give you a little awareness test this morning. This will check to see not only if you're awake, but to see about your inattentional blindness. Okay. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? Okay, so it's easy to miss things you're not looking for. Lesson one for the morning, right? So when we are out in the world and we're doing DevOpsy things and we're trying to implement changes, we have to be aware of our inattentional blindness. We have to understand that there are things that we're looking for and that's great. But we need to expand our minds, get, flex the muscles of looking for things, anticipating the unexpected. And it's not something that we're going to catch everything. We could never anticipate everything. But the more we stretch those muscles and the more we think about them, the better we're going to do at this. So we acknowledge most of you had an attentional blindness. Some of you saw it. Maybe you've seen the video before. Maybe you haven't. But it means that we could be measuring something and think that we're doing amazing, but we're missing how we're destroying something else over to the side. Has anybody ever fixed it over here and broke it over there? Right? Yes, so that's what this is. And why this is important is because we work in complex adaptive systems. Anytime you put humans together, you're automatically in a complex adaptive system. And you've heard this word multiple times yesterday. I know John Willis talked about it. I think Pete Chesna talked about it. And systems thinking isn't necessarily about, well, it's not at all about how uh, computer systems work or how physical systems work necessarily. Uh, Peter Singe, who is a MIT Sloan uh, School of Management lecturer, and he's also the author of The Fifth Discipline. It's a book about learning organizations. He's well regarded as an expert on systems thinking. And he defines systems thinking as the ability to see the consequences of your actions. It's as simple as that. This talk is about helping us be a better systems thinker. So by looking at not only what we expect, but looking and trying to look at things that we otherwise wouldn't expect. <clears throat> so to tie it back to the inattentional blindness, to be a good systems thinker, we need to actively try to reduce our inattentional blindness. Now, I was giving a talk earlier this year on um, directed opportunism or intent-based leadership. Has anybody ever read David Marquet, Turn the Ship Around? If you, okay, a few people, great book. It's all about how to put autonomy closer and decision making closer to the people who have the information. Well, in prep for that, I looked at some more, you know, heavier theory books and one that I read was The Art of Action by Stephen Bungay. Great book too. But he says that we have three gaps when we're trying to turn outcomes into actual effects. We have the knowledge gap, the alignment gap, and the effects gap. 
And we deal with these sometimes in very unproductive ways. So the knowledge gap is when we have difference between what we know and what we would like to know. So let's say we are delivering a new service for one of our stakeholders, one of those ones that always thinks their stuff is top priority. And the last time we delivered a service for someone, uh, we had a lot more work than was expected, and our delivery date shipped. So we had a knowledge gap. So how do we normally deal with the knowledge gap? Well, Bungay says, we add more detailed information. Okay? So now, we learned from that, and we're going to request or require that we get a full specifications doc. So that never happens to us again, right? We want all the information we could possibly have. So we get that, and we are churning along, and we actually got to start a little later, so we got to do some other stuff because we weren't in that whole rigmarole trying to figure that out. And now we're getting to the part where we want things to happen. And we find ourselves in the alignment gap. And this is where we have a difference between what we want people to do and what they actually do. So if you've ever seen that picture with a whole bunch of different examples about someone telling you to put a tire swing on a tree and all the different ways someone does that, well, even when we ask for full specifications doc, there are a lot of room, there's a lot of room for interpretation there. So inevitably, we did something that wasn't quite the way that the stakeholder wanted it to happen. Okay. And they weren't happy about that, so their reaction is to add more detailed instruction. Right. So now we're adding more information, more instruction, and the form that takes is that the BA is now going to give us a lot of information about how we should implement that because we didn't do it the way they wanted, and so this seems like the right choice for us to do. So we start delivering that, and then when we deliver it, we find ourselves in the effects gap. And that is the difference between what we expected our actions to achieve and what actually happened. So <clears throat> despite all of our planning, that extra information, that extra instruction, we still delivered a little late, which was a problem because this was highly tied to a marketing event. And so all of our customers were expecting the service to be released on a certain day, but we missed it. And then overnight, the first night, we had an outage. We recovered very quickly, but our customers in Europe, they were affected, and that was big egg on our face, right? There was, you know, this was a situation, at least in the first day, <clears throat> that it was super embarrassing for us to have that outage. So now, we have this effects gap, and we're going to resolve that or prevent that in the future by adding more detailed controls. Okay, so now we are requiring, our management is requiring all of our changes to go through CAB, Change Approval Board, for executive approval. Okay, it meets every week. You can come to the CAB, present your thing, and, um, you know, if the manager thinks it makes sense, they'll check it off and you can go on your merry way. Well, the problem with that is that the people with that control don't always have the information, and I've been a manager on a cab, and I know how security theater or whatever type of thing that can be. So there are some good things about having information, instructions, and control. It's not bad inherently. It can prevent some problems and keep us from going down the wrong path, but it's that when we do it in out of balance when we keep reacting with, well, that didn't work, so let me do more of it. Because obviously you just didn't have enough information. So now the next time we do it, we're going to have more information, more instruction, more controls, and it becomes a vicious cycle. Okay? We shouldn't just do more of things because that's all we know. We want to use the right tools at the right time and in the right amounts. And we need to recognize that imbalance causes unintended consequences. So my thought, my husband is Swedish, so I have a, a very big connection to Sweden. My kids are dual citizens. We go there quite a lot. I speak a tiny bit of Swedish. There is a concept called logum. It's a Swedish concept that I think that we can learn here in America to help us put name to a concept we need to embrace. Okay? How it I believe that embracing this concept of logum can help us better achieve 
our intended consequences and get away from the imbalance of those negative unintended consequences. So the word logum is a little weird. It's like law and gum, and you smash it together. Logum, okay? And I'm not talking about the logum microservices framework. Does anybody ever use that? Have you heard of that? I was just checking for things online, and I saw, oh my gosh, there's a framework. So you don't know about that, so that's good. You're not confused about what I'm talking about. So what does logum mean? So I already said it's a Swedish word. It roughly translates to not too much, not too little, just enough, or just right. And it comes from, you know, supposedly the age of the Vikings. And it comes from a phrase, laget om, which means around the team. So when you're a Viking and you've, you know, done your day's work, you're sitting around the fire pit and, or the bonfire, and you've got your communal mead horn. You're passing it around and drinking and having a good time. Well, when that horn gets to you, you have to make a choice. How much mead do I drink, right? Do I drink too little and be really thirsty? You know, that's not great because I'll get cranky and, you know, belligerent. But you also don't want to drink too much, right? Because then this guy is going to get really upset that he didn't have any mead when it got to him. And unless you're in the mood for a fight, you know, you don't want to anger this guy. I wouldn't want to fight with a bunch of Vikings, probably even if I was another Viking. So caring as much for the whole as for yourself has large been a core of the Swedish culture. The problem is, is that here in America, it's not that we don't care for the whole. It's that we're a very achievement-based society. So we don't like people telling us when enough is. We want to have as much of the good things, as much as we want, and don't tell me when to stop. I'll know when I want to stop. I'll tell you when I've had enough. So logum isn't this limiting kind of concept. It's finding the ideal spot between too much and too little. It's avoiding starvation. You know, you don't want to be hungry at the end of your dinner and go to bed hungry. But we want to avoid gluttony as well. We don't want to feel like we're going to throw up after dinner because we just didn't stop ourselves from going too far. So it's more than enough, but still sets limits. So I think a better definition of logum for someone who didn't grow up with that concept and it doesn't just inherently make sense is that it's neither excessive nor sparse, but a perfect equilibrium or balance between two extremes. And we're going to talk about how this makes sense in corporate life. To me, it's a zone of contentment. Understanding what contentment really means, and interestingly enough, I, I was in a lift yesterday, and he asked me, I told him I was speaking, he asked me what my talk is about, and he said, what's the difference between complacency and contentment? It's like, wow, lift drivers are pretty deep, right? And <laughs> so, you know, we talked about it, and he said, complacency is when you stop looking around and caring about what the consequences are, and you just do what you're doing. Contentment is when you understand and you're still happy and you're balancing this for a better whole. Okay. So one of the things that gets in the way of our ability to do balance really well is binary thinking. Okay. I don't know about you, but I look out in our social and political climate right now and I see drastic multiple examples of binary thinking. This group is bad, this group is great. If you don't agree with me, you're horrible, I'm great. This sucks, that's awesome. Okay. We like to categorize and think in binaries because it actually is an easier cognitive load. So just like we can't see everything around us, we can't really put massive amounts of overwhelming thought into everything that we're looking at, right? So binary thinking isn't bad in general. You know, we know that stove is hot, ice is cold, you know, and, and things like that. But when we're dealing with a lot of our problems, usually the answer is things are somewhere between, ideas are somewhere between very good or very bad. And just like most people are somewhere between very short and very tall, most foods are between very unhealthy and very healthy, right? <clears throat> so the world is just a little more complicated than the categories that we use to define it. Binary thinking. Uh, really is a very polarizing thing, and Alia challenged me to put polar bears in. So unless you are a polar bear, polarizing is not really a good thing in the, in the organization. 
So we want to start looking at a spectrum. And spectrum thinking requires that we consider all the spaces in between those extremes. So <coughs> I'm going to give you an example here in a second. But say we have an extreme on either end, and we could choose to operate there. Usually we're going to be, if we're operating in an extreme, we're going to have a lot of negative or unintended consequences. So the way I think about it is, how do I find that zone of contentment? How do I find that best balance? Well, pulling back from that how to go to heck in a handbasket workshop from yesterday, I'm going to start thinking about how can I mess this up? What are the negative consequences of what I'm doing? And then I'm going to work back and try to think of, well, what would this look like if, it, if I did it just right, if I did it in just the right balance? And then do a little experimentation to find out where that balance is. Do I need to tend more towards this, but not all the way? The other way or somewhere right in the middle? So here's an example. <clears throat> and this is a, one that I hear a lot in the DevOps community. There's a big, I guess there's a sort of religious war in a way about is failure prevention better or is fast recovery better, right? Does anybody think operating at either extreme is the best place to be, like only do failure prevention or only do fast recovery? Anybody think that? Okay. So if we only did this, if we only focused on failure prevention, then we would have a lot of time and effort going into potentially things that will never happen or are very unlikely to happen. Okay? And if we never focused on, fail on uh, failure prevention and only focused on fast recovery, then we might hit the situation where there's a type of outage that any outage is really untenable. And even if we can recover quickly, we still have a big problem. So the likely answer is somewhere in between, where we might need to prevent some kind of critical outage, but then we have to be really good at recovering from the outages that do occur. Because there's also a fallacy that we can know about every prevent, everything that we could prevent and that we can prevent every outage. So somewhere in between is the better place to be. So the boundaries of logum are fuzzy. If you notice up here, there's not just yellow, then blue, then yellow. It's a real gradient between. And that's because there's no line that immediately, once you pass over it, you're in the bad zone or the good zone. This is all about trade-offs. And if I move towards this extreme, what are my impacts? What do my outcomes look like? If I move back to the middle, what does it look like? And then what if I overcorrect? Do I pass the point where we have these good outcomes and then start getting to negative outcomes again? So this is the concept that I want to help us try to think through today. So I mentioned that this is a core part of Swedish culture. And so it would make sense that I would share an example of how it's used in Swedish business. So when we think of Sweden, we think of Spotify, at least from a company basis. We all know about the Spotify model and all these things. By the way, Spotify says don't use the Spotify model, make your own model. But <coughs> they had a redesign and there was an article published in the Engadget website in about 2014. And they said that the guiding philosophy was that of logum. That meant they knew that there were lots of different things that they had to implement and balance. They had to decide, well, how, we want to be new and modern, but we don't want to be completely unfamiliar and turn off the people who were very comfortable with what we already had. We want to be feature rich, but we don't want to completely overwhelm people with a lot of stuff that gets in their way that they don't want or need. And then we want it to be beautiful. We don't want it to be too simple, but we also don't want it to be so over-designed that people think it's ridiculous. So they really had to think a lot about where in this balance, you know, where can I find balance between these, these kinds of concepts. And I spoke to another friend, Hook and Force, who is a real, uh, he's, he's a kata coach in Sweden. He does a lot of stuff with Legos, so you might have seen his things out there. He's worked at places like King, who, uh, does some games and other big places. And he says logum comes up a lot of times in discussions and decisions. What's the logum amount of you know, doing this or that? So <clears throat> if I haven't already made the point clear enough, context matters. Okay? I wanted to make sure to show you this because visuals are very compelling. And if I only showed you 
An example with the blue right in the middle, you might leave with the thought that the log in place to B is always right in the middle between two extremes. That's not the case. Sometimes the right place to be is nearer to one extreme or the other. Okay. I'm going to tell you a little story to help um, gel this in our minds. And I didn't come up with the story. I will tweet the story out later, but I thought it was great. So this is a parable with a great master and apprentice and programmers that are asking about how much unit testing to do. Okay. So there was a great master and an apprentice, and they were... In the, apprentice, or in the great master's office one day, and a programmer comes in in the morning and he says, great master, how much unit testing should I do? And the great master says, well, you just need to work on learning how to write good tests. And it's, you know, once you do that, then you can worry about code coverage. And the programmer smiled, bowed, and left. Around lunchtime, another programmer came in just as the great master was making some lunch. And she said, great master, how much unit test code coverage should I aim for? And he said, well, and he pointed to his boiling pot of water. He said, how many grains of rice should I put in this pot? And he said, well, she said, how would I possibly be able to tell you that? It depends on a lot of factors. It depends on how hungry you are, how many people you're going to feed, if they've already eaten things, what else you're serving, how many grains of rice you have in the first place. And he said, exactly. And she smiled, bowed, and left. And then towards the end of the day, a third programmer came in and said, great master, how much code coverage should I aim for when writing unit tests? And the great master, he said, 80% no less, and bounded, pounded his fist on the table. And the third programmer smiled, bowed, and left. Now, the apprentice was really confused because he had just seen his great master give three people three different answers for exactly the same question. And so he asked, why did you do that? And the great master replied, well, the first programmer, he really had never done any unit testing before. Worrying about code coverage right now would be very confusing and detracting, and he needed to learn how to write good unit tests first and then worry about good code coverage later. But the second programmer, she was already very well experienced in uh, both programming and, you know, programming unit tests. And so she had enough knowledge to understand that this was a complex issue. And she knows the complex issues sometimes better than I do, so she's smart enough to use that information and make the right decision. And he said, well, what about the third programmer? If that's the truth, then why did you tell him 80% and no less? And he said, well, the third programmer wanted simple answers when there were no simple answers. And when you give it to him, he's not going to follow it anyway. So that is the parable of logum. <laughs> uh, we want to do the second. We, this talk and finding Logum is about exploring the life of that second programmer, how you look at all the different things that go into making the right decision. Okay. So we talked about what we need to do pretty in depth. We have a decision we need to make. We need to operate somewhere in between two extremes. And we have no idea how to get there, right? So I, want, I, like, to do, I like to have utility in the things that I talk about. Well, it's fun to talk about theory, and you should do this and be inspiring. I like people to leave with something they can use to actually implement that. So even if you have canvas fatigue, I'm sorry, but I made a new canvas, which is really just a word for a visual way to provide a framework to think through a problem. So you might have seen an A3 template, which is a problem-solving canvas. Uh, I have come up with the Logum Discovery Canvas. And not all decisions are going to need this level of thought, just like sometimes binary thinking is good enough, uh, and sometimes it's OK that we don't see everything. Not all decisions need an immense amount of thought. What you want to put through this kind of thought process depends on the impact of making the wrong choice. And if you're having a problem right now and you're thinking this might be useful, then maybe it is a good decision. But I wanted to give you some examples of things that you might use, and you know, the parable gave us one example. How much code coverage should we do? How much documentation should we write? How much should we focus on risk prevention versus fast recovery? How much should we standardize on one thing or let people optimize on another? Anytime you're trying to make a decision about how much to do of something, it's good to think about, put it through a process that makes you think about the impacts of all your choices 
and then hone in on the one that feels most comfortable for you. Because what's logum for your team? If someone else comes and tells you, well, this is our logum, you should do this. That's not a helpful answer because they're not in your context. What's good for them may not be good for you. So it's just like we don't want to tell, we didn't like the third programmer answer, 80%. Taking that 80% would be like taking someone else's story and applying it blindly to your situation. You have to think through these things yourself. There's, sometimes there just aren't simple answers. So don't worry about reading all of this, and I do have this available online on my website. Um, this is a canvas, and this is an example of the key. So if you were to download this, you'd get the blank version with nothing written in the things but the headers, and you'd get this page that has some helper questions. Okay? So essentially, it starts with a decision. We need to understand what we're putting through this process. Then we need to think about, well, what does operating at exactly the right amount look like? And then once we understand that, we can say, well, what does operating at too much or too little of this look like? What are the impacts of that? And then we'll say, well, which, if we were left unmanaged, where would we naturally operate? And then we can use that information to help us make a hypothesis and experiment our way to closer to that happy picture that we came up with. So it all starts with a decision. So you're, you either have a problem that you're trying to get to a balance or you're preemptively trying to get to a place of balance before there's a problem. So <clears throat> what decision do you need help with? I'm going to put an example through this process and I'm going to pull something from the opening of this talk. So we have stakeholders and way too much to do. Does anyone not have way too much to do? Are you in a zone of contentment right now with your work? OK. So nobody raised their hand, either because you're tired or you don't have that. And <laughs> that means that when someone asks you to do something, you have a choice. You have a choice to either start it right now and make finishing other things longer, or put that on, you know, make people wait so that you can finish things faster. So a good thing I might ask myself, and I do this all the time when I teach Kanban, when we get to how to limit your work and process, we have to talk about, well, how much do we limit it? So there's no simple answer. I can't, as a coach, tell someone 10. You know, it doesn't make sense. So I'm going to ask, how much work should we have in process at once for my team? Okay. Now I have to think about what are the ideal outcomes that would come about if I had just that right amount of work in process. Okay. And so in this situation, normally you'd probably be a little more specific about you know, your good outcomes. You could be a little more quantitative to it but I'm being a little more general in this example. I know that I would be looking for fast delivery. I would be looking to keep pace with the business. So the rate with, um, and I hate pe when people say the business, so I just said that. I, we are the business. We're keeping pace with requests that come in. So that means I'm, put, I'm finishing work at a similar rate to requests coming in. I'm not building up a growing and growing and growing backlog pile. My team is challenged but not overwhelmed. They actually want to come back to work tomorrow. And we have good quality, a low number of bugs, high customer satisfaction rates. So that's sort of what I'm shooting for. And if I get to a point where all these are checked off, I'm at my logum state or should be pretty close. But now we have to think about what happens when we operate at either extreme. And we want to think about both the positive and the negative consequences because we need to acknowledge that operating in extreme may provide some benefit, but also has unintended consequences elsewhere. Okay. This is also the mental stretching part of the exercise. So it's easy for you to understand what happens when you have too much work going on because you experience that right now. But has anyone never experienced too little work? Okay, so yeah, we've had people that have never, ever experienced too little work. Early in my days at CNN.com, um, I guess I didn't have enough challenging work to do, and I found myself with copious amounts of time that no learning could fill, and I hated my job every day because I didn't have enough valuable work to do. I didn't feel important. So too little is just as damaging as too bad, too much. So let's look at what might happen. So if I have too little work to do, 
guess what? I have fast delivery because I'm ready. As soon as that comes in, I can get it out really fast. I can keep pace. Um, I'm actually faster than the pace, which could sort of be a negative, but I'll give it a check here. My people are bored, really, really bored, unhappy. And because they're bored, it's hard to put everything you have into something when you're unhappy with your job, especially when you're bored and you don't feel valued. So our quality is suffering a little bit. Maybe not as bad as when we're overworked, but still pretty bad. And maybe one of the worst things is that we're seen as overstaffed because we're not filling you know, our resource efficiency to at least a good enough level. And so we're a target to have our headcount cut. So that's not great. But then we have too much as well. So we have slow delivery because essentially when we have too much work in our system, we're doing like a round robin where we do a little bit of work on this to get those people to shut up. And then we move here and do a little bit of work on that. And it takes forever for any one thing to get done. Lots of context switching. And because it's taking a long time for work to get done, we are falling behind. We're not keeping pace with our, with our stakeholders. So our backlog is growing and growing while our you know, rate of output is decreasing and decreasing. Our team is extremely burned out. They, uh, we have poor quality, not just because they're burned out, maybe that's part of it, but when you have to context switch so much, you don't, you're not able to have one complete thought and finish something. And we work on complex things, and that's a huge problem. And so not only is the team burned out, but they're super frustrated because it doesn't feel like we have any time for improvement. I heard someone talk about that yesterday after one of the talks. They said, well, what if, I think it was Pete Chesna's talk, what if nobody gives us time to do the security? Well, then security is not a value at the organization. What if people don't give us time to do improvement? Well, improve it is not a value at your organization. So neither one of these places is the ideal place to be. Perhaps the most important question that really is the key to doing the next part is discovering what the natural tendency is. So if I was left unmanaged, if my team and organization was left unmanaged, would we be at the zone of perfect contentment with work coming in? It doesn't sound like it. Nobody raised their hand. Uh, so do we operate it too little or too much? And from my experience and overwhelmingly from the raising hands or not raising hands, we operate at the zone of too much, right? So we just check a little box to note our natural tendency. The reason why that's important is because we have to decide what to do. What, what hypothesis should we build for what we can do to get us to that place of contentment? And essentially what we need to do is generally push away from that natural tendency from the extreme on one side, more towards the other without going over the sweet spot, right? It's, has, I don't know if I'm showing my age, but the price is right, where they're like close to a dollar without going over, that's sort of where we wanna be. Um, finding that spot but not going over past the point of diminishing or even negative returns. Okay. So based on the natural tendency of doing too much, I can make a hypothesis. Okay. What might help me get closer to log them? Well, I can say my team has about 30 things in process at one time. Maybe going down to 20 would be good. Okay, so that's the first part of my hypothesis. Uh, well, that is my hypothesis. I think if we drop from 30 to 20, then we'll get closer to the place where we want to be. Then we are going to do an experiment. We're going to do like Nicole Forsgren, who's going to speak later today, says. We're going to rub a little science on it, right? We're going to be scientists. And if we have a hypothesis, which you should always get, never jump forward into action without understanding what you think should come out of it, because then, at the end, you have nothing to compare back to and know if it was successful or not, right? So even if we go through that process really quickly, a hypothesis is a key part for continuous improvement, or even isolated improvement. So we need to plan how we're gonna test our hypothesis. We want to say, what exactly will we do in this experiment to see if our hypothesis is right? How will we know? that it moved the needle and in the right direction, and then when will you review it? That's where we often fall down as we do the plan and we do the thing, but then sometimes we don't review. So let's say my team, say we use JIRA or something like that, we have an agile board, and it has 
Uh, the ability to limit your work in process, it's a feature. I just need to enable it. So first thing, I'll enable the feature. Then I'll set my column to 20. And now I'll get visual indicators when we go over 20. So that's the easy part of that, right? It's pretty easy to do. The less easy part of this experiment design is understanding, well, what are the exceptions? Will I always just stick to 20 no matter what? If you had to stop the line and you said, sorry, we're at 20, would that really fly? Probably not, right? So we're going to only exceed our WIF limits, work in process limits, for stop the line events. Okay? And then we're going to meet back in a month and we're going to review throughput, that's how many things we get done. We're going to review cycle time, that's the duration of how long it took us to do it. We're going to review quality, which is customer sat and bug numbers. And we're going to review team satisfaction. Are they hating life, loving life, or somewhere in between? Okay. Oh, one thing I wanted to say is please do stick around for Nicole's talk. She's going to be talking about metrics. And choosing metrics is a skill. So um, when someone asked me about log and whether it was more science or art, I said it's really a blend of both. We're using data, which is the science part, where we want to get to a point where we're making data-driven decisions, but there's a lot of skill in figuring some of this out. There's skill in deciding which metrics to use, and there's skill at which trade-offs to take along the way to find the place of balance. So uh, that talk, I think, might be a little helpful in that area. So when we get to our month time, we want to study. We want to say, what do our success metrics tell you? Are we closer to log them, farther away, or did we stay pretty much in the same place? So let's fast forward that month ahead, and I'm looking at all those metrics I mentioned, and I could find that maybe we're on the right track. We're not really there yet, though. So we're keeping pace with requests, and we're reducing burnout, but our quality hasn't moved. Customer sat's the same, bugs haven't changed. Uh, and we noted, too, some additional information that we adhered to WIP limits about 60% of the time. And so we investigated to see why is that. And, well, we found out that we had a lot of stop-the-line incidents, right? And so that meant that instead of working on 20 things, we were often working on 25, you know, or, or so items. So now we need, now that we know how we did, we're on the right track, but we're not quite there. We want to think about the last part in the scientific cycle, which is PDSA or the Deming cycle. It's, do we want to tweak the hypothesis or tweak the plan and keep moving? or create a brand new hypothesis. We've disproven this one and it doesn't work. For this, we're deciding, well, we're going to adjust the whip limit down to 15 because we know if our sweet spot is really 20, we need to reduce it to allow those stop the lines to fill the rest of the gap. So this is like the way where if you're trying to figure out how much planned work to do and you know you have a lot of unplanned work, you have to put the planned work pretty down low until you can start mitigating some of the unplanned work. So until we can reduce the stop the line events, we need to have less work in process and we'll check in in another month. So this is an example of putting a high level example, a light one of putting a decision through that kind of right sizing framework. And no matter what happens, we want to make sure that we celebrate all the information. If you're a scientist and we are rubbing science on this, we want to celebrate uh, hypothesis failing and being validated. Because if you're a scientist, any result is good because you learned something. And that's what we want to do here. So celebrate big and small, but don't take your eye off the ball. Okay? We have to continue to apply pressure away from that natural tendency so that we don't float back to it. Uh, it's like I went scuba diving in Charleston and I had to swim just to stay in place as the current was so strong. So if the current of your natural tendency is pretty strong, even if we're just trying to maintain our place, you still have to put effort out. And we don't want to forget or not see when uh, other things are happening or when maybe our conditions are changing and the definition of what's just right also changes. We have to be looking out for that and be able to find our way to that new logum. Now, <laughs> I've been talking about a decision in isolation, but when we get to systems thinking, it's not only understanding the unintended consequences of your individual decision, but also the interaction of all those decisions. So my mental picture is one of an equalizer. So if that decision that I just walked through or anyone that you might make is one slider on this equalizer, 
then you know, all of the other ones are other decisions that you've made, and each one individually can sound awesome. But when you put them all together in an organization or a transformation, you might get a little bit of things that don't blend well together. So occasionally, you might have to tweak one that was individually perfect the way it was. You might have to take a little away or add a little more to it to have a more harmonious whole. Okay? <coughs> I think I want to leave you with a thought that helps us sort of be okay with taking away from that perfection a little bit in one area. If we've achieved something really awesome, but we have over-optimized for ourselves, and we need to make the whole better, I think this is a good way for me to justify why that is a good thing. So Peter Drucker, Drucker's Law, says you will achieve the greatest results in business and career if you drop the word achievement from your vocabulary and replace it with contribution. So when we're in a large system, when we're in a transformation, we are focusing on individual achievement, but not at the expense of contributing to the whole system. So takeaways, if you don't take away anything else, adopt spectrum thinking instead of binary thinking. Anticipate the unintended impacts of decisions and actions. Experiment to find logum, which is that range of best balance. And then check if your logum decisions combine to make a logum whole. Thank you so much. And you can contact me in any one of these ways to find more. And I'll be around until at least 345 or 4 today. So thank you so much.